Do you find that things at work are constantly changing? Stakeholders or product managers are changing their minds, or maybe the market is changing daily. Maybe you aren't getting access to users and you aren't sure what the right feature is to tackle next. Maybe there's just so much to take in that you're having a hard time digesting it all. Perhaps you understand one part of the system, but you're having a hard time understanding certain aspects of the bigger picture. The chances are good that you're not alone. This is all pretty common. It's actually common enough that there's an acronym to describe it all. And if you've experienced any or all of these problems, then you're living in a VUCA world. So stick around and we'll break it down. What's up, UX fam? How's your mom and them? Welcome to another episode of Beyond UX Design. I'm Jeremy. If you're new here, welcome to the show. I am super stoked to have you. And if you haven't done it already, please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you are a regular here and you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would really appreciate you leaving a five-star review. Not just five stars, I'm talking about a couple sentences. That'll help me out way more than you can imagine. And I have some exciting news. I'd like to welcome a brand new patron to the show. Stacy. thank you so much for your support. It means so much to me that you, you found any of this stuff helpful enough to support the show. And I'm humbled that you're finding this stuff useful enough to help out every month. Thank you so much. And as always, thanks so much to Chris and Siroquan for their support. And if you want to join Chris, Siroquan, and Stacy and help keep the show independent and ad-free, you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month. And if you do that, you'll get some sweet, sweet perks for your support. And of course, if you think this show is worth sharing, then I would love it if you told some friends. And for more information on how you can support the show and help more people find out about what we're doing here, make sure to check out beyonduxdesign.com slash support. Last week, I briefly touched on this topic of VUCA as it relates to design in the real world. And the chances are good that you've never heard this term before. And if you have heard this term, you've likely heard it in the context of corporate leadership training or books for CEOs or C-level executives or something like that. And I'm honestly not sure I've ever really heard VUCA in the context of design until I started doing some research for this episode. So at this point, you're probably just asking yourself, Jeremy, what the hell is VUCA? Shut up already. Tell me what it is. So what is VUCA? Well, VUCA is an acronym that stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. And VUCA was first described in 1985 by two economists and university professors, two guys named Warren Bennis and Bert Nannis. And they wrote a book called Leaders, The Strategies for Taking Charge. And in that book, they discussed some challenges that were posed to leaders by various external factors. And after the collapse of the USSR, the Soviet Union, the U.S. Army War College actually started using the term to help the U.S. navigate all these changes that resulted from the USSR dissolving almost overnight and with new states popping up throughout all the former Soviet Union. You know, after the end of this long-term enemy that we called, quote-unquote, the Eastern Bloc, the challenge for the U.S. and its allies was to find new ways of responding in a multipolar world where new allies and enemies might just pop up from all over the world without much warning. And all these new countries, they had different political alliances. Some of them had leftover Soviet military equipment. Some of them had Soviet nukes. So how might these new states react to the U.S. and NATO? Would they align with the West? Or would they align closer with places like China and Iran? That sounds pretty VUCA to me. So for the last couple of decades, VUCA has been pretty popular with leadership gurus and executive coaches. But this hasn't been something design teams or even software teams in general, I think, have been talking about. At least it hasn't been on my radar. So I hope that this episode today helps to shed some light on how these principles can apply to software and to UX discipline more specifically. Because from my perspective, all those things that I talked about a minute or two ago completely apply to the things that I've experienced throughout my career. So I'm really excited about diving into this topic today. So first, let's talk about leadership here. Leadership is critical for a successful UX career. And I might talk about leadership behaviors and that overall concept of leadership, but I want to stress that when I talk about these things, I'm not talking about managers or people who lead teams in any official capacity. I believe very strongly that even junior designers can be leaders. And this is especially true if you land a job in a small team or if you're a design team of one. You are the voice of UX in your org. The team will or at least should look to you as the leading expert on UX within your company. So not to add any pressure here, but all those leadership behaviors that we talked about back in episode five, if you haven't listened to episode five yet on leadership, 
please go back and listen to those things because leadership behaviors are critical to navigating a VUCA environment. Then the really critical thing to remember as we talk about these various things is that a lot of this uncertainty is nearly impossible to navigate if you're not taking some ownership of your own actions. A lot of people on our teams will try to sit in the back seat and wait for someone to tell them what to do or come up with some idea. And obviously not everybody on our team can be the decision maker. So if you're saying, Jeremy, I really don't think I'm capable of leading a team through uncertain times, I think that is totally fine. But if you are a junior designer and you do feel this way, my hope is that you're at least listening to this episode to understand those concepts, understand what to look out for, understand how to navigate some of these scenarios so that as you progress through your career, as you work your way up, that you are familiar with these ideas and you can start to apply them as you begin to feel more comfortable taking on a bigger role within your team. So before we start conflating, all of these four separate concepts into one, it's important to remember that VUCA is not one monolithic thing. It's it's kind of a framework to understand how you might want to react and mitigate issues related to the amount of information you have and how well you can predict something might happen. Each of these scenarios can happen on their own. You may have a lot of one and a little of the other. You may have a lot of all, you may have a little of all. And these are not monolithic things here. So you can't prepare for VUCA. You need to prepare and be ready for V and U and C and A separately, right? So each is different. Each requires a different approach to prepare and to navigate. And ironically, VUCA in itself is kind of VUCA. So in the show notes, I have a link to a Forbes article by a guy named Jurin Krayenbrink. And by the way, if you're, if you're an English speaker and you're not familiar with some European languages, there's J's in there and stuff, not Y's. Uh, but go check out the show notes for a link to that article. Um, and it has, some, it has an illustration of what high and low variation of these various concepts can look like. And I think that'll help you quite a bit understanding how these different scenarios might play out. And as designers, we're likely visual learners. And I know it sucks that this is a podcast and you can't see the visuals. So check out that Forbes article, which I think can really help to show how you can have variances in the levels of each of these four things. And I think it'll make a lot of sense when you see it. So back in 2014, two guys, Nate Bennett and James Lemoyne, published an article, a research paper on how we might navigate these various scenarios. And from that paper, they created a framework that we can use to help identify and then understand the best strategies and tactics that we can use to help us make better decisions when we're faced with one of these scenarios. And what they did was they create kind of a four blocker chart, right? An X and a Y axis on the four quadrants. So on the Y axis is how well we can predict the results of whatever action we decide to take. And on the X axis is how much we know about the situation. So in the four quadrants on the top and the right with high predictability and high knowledge of the given scenario, in the bottom right, we have low predictability, but high understanding of what we do know. And in the bottom left quadrant, We have low predictability and low understanding. And finally, in the top left quadrant, we have high predictability and low understanding. And if you're you're having trouble visualizing this, again, check out the show notes for a link to this chart. Uh, Going through this, we can lay out the four different scenarios that is VUCA. All right, so let's actually get into those now. I probably talked a lot about that and you're probably just wondering what the hell I'm talking about. So first, volatile. So volatile environments are usually characterized by high predictability and high understanding. The problem here isn't that we don't know something or we can't predict something. The problem is that there are so many scenarios, we just don't know which one is going to play out. So there can be a lot of changes when it comes to software that are completely outside of our control, right? The length of time to solve the given problem can fluctuate. Maybe we think we have the answers and then suddenly we don't anymore. Volatility is exactly what it sounds like. Things can change without warning at any moment, which might leave us unprepared. It might not be overly complicated, right? These might be really simple changes and it might not be hard to predict the outcome, but the change can keep us from knowing what the right decision is. So let's think about an example. An example of this might be, you know, a wishy-washy stakeholder or a manager who changes their mind all the time. We prepare for one scenario and then the rug is just sort of pulled out from under us at the last minute, right? Constant pivots from leadership when it comes to priorities, things like this. Some other examples might be unexpected market changes that require the team to quickly pivot their product strategy to try to stay relevant. 
could be changes in technology that require the team to rapidly adapt their approach to try to accommodate some new platforms or new features. Could be new entries to the market that force the, the team to rapidly iterate, improve the product to stay competitive. It could be external factors like natural disasters, economic crisis, pandemic, right? These all require the team to quickly adapt to changing circumstances. All right, next, uncertain. Uncertain environments are usually characterized by low predictability, but a high understanding of the situation. And in an uncertain environment, the path forward is just not clear. There are a lot of potential scenarios that we can understand well, but we have absolutely no idea which one might play out. So an example of this might be that you know some big announcement from some government watchdog is coming, but you have no idea the direction that the watchdog will decide to go. So each scenario may impact your company in different ways that could ultimately change the direction of your product. So the difference here between uncertain and volatile is volatile, you have no idea what might come. There's just a sudden thing, a pandemic. You had no idea the day before that the pandemic would come. In an uncertain environment, you know that something is coming, but you just don't know what it is. So that's the difference between those two. So some other examples of uncertain could be we're launching a new product in a new market. There's little data, no data available on users. We, we know that they're out there. We just don't know what it is. Could be dealing with conflicting feedback from users or stakeholders about the design of a product or feature. So you have ideas. You just don't know which one is right. Developing a product for new technology. It's not been, been widely adopted, right? This could require the team to make educated guesses about what users' needs and behaviors might be. Designing for a user base that has a diverse and evolving needs. It could require the team to regularly gather feedback and adjust their approach as they see fit. All right, next, complex. A complex environment is generally characterized by high predictability and low understanding. So you can easily determine how individual scenarios might play out, but there may be so many moving parts that it's all overwhelming. So in a complex environment, there are lots of moving parts. It might not be hard to digest all of these in small chunks, but when you try to put them all together, it could be just extremely overwhelming to understand it all together, right? So for example, you know, there, there could be tons of dependencies in our system. Maybe there are lots of stakeholders, right? And they all have to be brought into a conversation. Now, generally speaking, the bigger your organization is, the harder it is to keep track of all of these moving parts. So some more examples could be, you know, you were developing a product or a feature that requires integration of multiple systems or platforms. Third-party platforms might even be harder. Working on a project with multiple stakeholders, and they all have different priorities and, and competing interests. We could be developing a product that requires integration with multiple third-party platforms, like I said, or systems that with varying levels of complexity and documentation. Could be working on projects with a large number of personas or use cases that require the team to prioritize, maybe a balance competing needs and requirements, okay? Uh, ambiguous. An ambiguous environment is characterized by low predictability and low understanding. And in an ambiguous environment, there are a lot of unknowns. Maybe relationships are, are totally unclear, or maybe there aren't any historical precedents for us to reference, right? There are a lot of unknown unknowns. And an example of this might be, you know, a lack of access to users. You aren't sure what pieces of your product are valuable to them. And maybe you're getting a new director and you have no idea who it will be or what they'll decide to do, right? Or you just aren't sure what exactly your next roadmap item should be. Here's some more examples. Unclear project goals or objectives. They, they could require the team to reprioritize and to try to focus on the most important aspects of the project. Ambiguous or changing user needs. They could require the team to gather regular feedback to ensure that the product is meeting the needs. Could be lack of clarity about the user's problems, which could require the team to engage in, in something like extensive research to uncover insights and identify some new opportunities. Could be developing a product or feature for a new and untested market. And that could require the design team to gather feedback and validate some of these assumptions through some experimenting or testing, right? So real quick, a note on ambiguous versus uncertain. They sort of sound the same. I think it's worth calling out the similarities and also the distinction between these two, ambiguous and uncertain. They are not the same. So think about uncertainty refers to a situation where the outcomes are unknown or unpredictable, even if the underlying causes of the situation are well understood. In the context of something like UX design, uncertainty might arise when we're developing a product for a new market and there is little or no available data on the users. Ambiguity, on the other hand, refers to situations where the goals and objectives or the requirements of a project are totally unclear or undefined. This obviously makes it difficult to determine the best approach 
or to measure progress or success. So in the context of UX design, ambiguity might arise when there's a lack of clarity about the user's problems or needs or when a stakeholder provides some conflicting feedback or requirements. So just to be clear, uncertainty relates to the predictability of outcomes, while ambiguity relates to the clarity of goals and the objectives. I hope that makes sense. So as you can see, these things are all different. There may be a little overlap here and there, but for the most part, VUCA is not necessarily one thing to plan for. It's V-U-C-A. These are all different scenarios. So please don't try to conflate VUCA into a single thing. So in their research paper, Bennett and Lemoyne lay out some ways to account for the various scenarios and how your team can navigate them successfully. So we're going to go through some things here. And we'll lay out some strategies and some tips and tricks on how to prepare for each of these four scenarios. So first, in a volatile environment, our challenge is constant change. So you need to make sure that you devote some of your time to try to hedge your bets. Maybe you don't spend all your time creating new prototypes for each possible scenario, but at the very least, be prepared for some contingencies. Keep them in the back of your mind. Be prepared to talk about these different scenarios or concepts or ideas in a meeting. You may want to spend time working through different process maps based on the different scenarios. Or maybe you want to think about different features that may be necessary as that environment changes. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. In a volatile environment, try to build in some additional buffer time if you can, because you may need to pivot, which could cause delays. So plan for some additional time if you think you might need it. And every scenario can be different, but just keep reminding yourself that there will be change. A change is coming. So just try to be as prepared as you possibly can. All right, next. In an uncertain environment, our main challenge is a lack of foresight. So do everything that you can to understand as much as possible to understand what may happen. So focus on the users. I think that's the most important part. Conduct research, discovery, to understand what the users are doing and what they actually want. And if you're working for a large company and there's uncertainty around what other teams are doing, make sure to network with your colleagues on other teams. This is huge. This could be a great way to keep your ear to the ground to find out what other teams are doing and find out what they might want to be doing in the future. This is especially true if you're an enterprise where understanding what a user does today might not be the same as what the business wants them to do tomorrow. So make sure you understand not just from the user's perspective, but from the business perspective as well, what may come later. Or maybe you stay up to date with industry journals about what could be happening outside of your company. Just make sure you learn as much as you can about whatever it is that you need to know to be successful. This will help you pivot when it comes time to change. And in these cases, the design team may need to make educated guesses or take a calculated risk in order to move forward. And they may need to be prepared to adjust their approach based on different feedback or different results. In a complex environment, our challenge is that it's hard to digest it all. So try breaking up the problems into more digestible chunks. Start at the start of the problem if you're getting confused. Try to document everything so someone else coming after you has an easier time. And really, do not be afraid to ask for help from experts if something feels overwhelming. Maybe even invest some time bringing on experts who are knowledgeable in the areas that you aren't familiar with. Maybe you need to bring on somebody who can help with things like quantitative analytics or some specific type of research if your team doesn't know how to do that. Don't try to take this on all by yourself if you can't make sense of it all. Make sure you bring in help and find people who can specialize in those specific areas if you have trouble processing all of it together. All right, lastly, in an ambiguous environment, Our challenge is a lack of understanding of certain aspects of the problem. And in this case, you really want to experiment. Try very hard to keep track of cause and effect. Keep track of your analytics and use data to your advantage so that you can make the best possible decision that you can make at that moment in time. And try to set up your experiments so results might be applied more broadly if you're low on resources and you can't perform a ton of research. In these cases, the design team may need to engage in extensive user research or work closely with stakeholders to try to clarify those goals and objectives in order to establish a clear direction for the project. This is where we want to think about outcomes over output. 
So the last thing that I want you to remember is that this information is not just for CEOs or corporate leadership training. These concepts can be applied more broadly to everyone on the software team, especially the design team. It doesn't matter where you work. I am fairly confident that these scenarios are something that you have run into before or will absolutely run into somewhere in the future. In my experience, I found that the design team is often left out of important meetings or things are handed down from various stakeholders. And the end result is often a combination of many of these things that I've talked about today for the design team. So the next time you're handed a set of requirements and something seems off, make sure you think about that level of unknowns and predictability and try to determine what type of scenario you're faced with. And from there, I think you'll be able to determine what your best course of action should be to get the best result for the users and your business. And lastly, I want to say that these concepts can be really overwhelming, especially if you've never heard about them or looked into them before. That's totally fine. It's totally fair. I first heard about these concepts years ago. I read a few books about it, and I still wouldn't consider myself an expert on these things by any means. But my hope is that you're taking away some key concepts from this episode, and you're at least aware of these ideas. So as you run into them, you might at least know what to look for and maybe where you can even start to get some more insight. And I found a ton of useful articles for this show. So check out the show notes for some really helpful links so you can dive a little bit deeper. Well, all right, y'all, I think that's it for me for today. I hope to help give you a little more insight into this concept of VUCA and provide you some tactics on how you can thrive in that VUCA world. But I'm curious, is this the first time you've heard of any of this stuff? And if not, where'd you learn it? I'm curious, was, was this in the context of design or was it more one of those leadership training courses like I talked about? Uh, let me know what you think on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at hello at beyondUXdesign.com. I'd love to hear from you. And if you like what you heard today, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would love it if you left a five-star review. Again, not just five stars. I'm talking about a couple sentences. That'll help me out way more than you can imagine. And if you know somebody who might find any of this stuff useful, why don't you tell them about the show? That'll help out a whole lot. And if you want to help keep the show independent and ad-free, check out those Patreon sponsor packages at beyonduxdesign.com slash support. You can join Chris, Siraquan, and Stacy by supporting the show for as little as $3 per month. And there are some awesome perks like a badass holographic Beyond UX design sticker that you can get. You can get a shout out on the show each week. There's even a package to meet with me for 30 minutes every month. And don't forget to sign up for the newsletter and check out all those past episodes at beyondUXdesign.com. I hope you keep coming back for more great UX tips from Beyond UX Design. And until next time, remember, you're more than a designer because there's so much more to UX and design. I'll see you around. Take care, y'all.